Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Rather, my name is Nicholas Wright. I'm a licensed professional counselor here in Virginia. I've been doing clinical work, uh, mental health work for about 10 years. Uh, and I'm also owner of my own private practice, Wright Group Counseling. And I appreciate you all coming today to the Centera Martha Jefferson series. And today we're going to talk about challenges Black men face and the importance of mental health. Uh, so if you all end up having some questions that you want answered or maybe a subject matter that you want discussed, discuss, uh, feel free to put it in the chat and I will try to address it uh, near the end of the presentation. Uh, because I know that there are some people here who might want to hear certain subject matter and I want to make sure that you get um, what you're looking for. Uh, having access to a black male therapist. All right. So today we're going to talk about the challenges that black men face. A lot of times when men speak, especially black men in spaces, sometimes we wear that mask. And as cliche as that might sound, it's one of these things that happens. And we know that these things are happening because black men are dying at an alarming rate related to suicide and also mental health. Did you know that Black students are less likely to ask for help than other races when performing academically? But this presentation is going to add that space so we can take these masks off and so we can have that level playing field. So to be a Negro in this country, and to be relatively conscious is to be in a state of rage almost, almost all the time and in one's work. That was James Baldwin. Now this is a complex thing. It can't be made simple. So I wanna make sure to highlight that. You simply have to try to deal with it in all its complexity and hope to get that complexity across. If it was a really easy subject matter, we would fix it right away, right? But it's going to take time and it's going to take spaces like these so we can grow and develop what we're looking for. Now, keep in mind the challenges that Black men face. I mean, it's well known that exposure to racism and discrimination are linked to various adverse mental health outcomes. The effects of systemic racism on Black Americans has been persistent and profound and the increase in media reports the images of police brutality, violence inflicted upon members of the black community have only added insult to the injury. The impact can be chronic and traumatic. These traumatic events related to racism have been unrelenting for blacks. Now noted on the screen, here are some of the key facts on black men's outcomes in eight important domains compared to black men with white men. So education, upward mobility, earnings, labor force, unemployment during the pandemic, uh, i.e. being laid off during the pandemic. And keep in mind, like when we're looking at these unemployment rates, unemployment rates are defined by people searching for jobs. So not people who don't want to work, but people that are actually searching for work and can't find it. Life expectancy, COVID-19, along with the criminal justice system. So when we look at the education aspect, I wanted to pay attention to the idea that young black men are poorly served in the schools. A lot of times when you're looking at stats, if you even go to the local high schools um, and beyond um, outside of Charlottesville, one of the big statistics that shows is how well are African-American children performing compared to uh, their white counterparts or the other minority groups or, or others. And a lot of times in these spaces, it's been noted that the Black men are struggling. So upward mobility, this contributes to the mental health crisis that we have. Um, the idea that Black boys 
um, are, are struggling with the ability to grow and achieve and move up in, in financial financial spaces. So the idea of the earnings, the earnings aspect. Labor force participation, black men are less likely to participate in the labor force. Um, so labor force being trade. Um, it's, it's tougher for them to obtain these, these accesses that are supposed to be equal, but they're struggling to find. Um, a lot of times people would say that removing vocational programs from the core 40 curriculum or the high school curriculum is one of the worst things that ever could have happened because you create a space where a lot of children, specifically black men, feel like that the only way that they can learn is through standardized testing. And if they don't perform well using standardized testing, are they really of importance to the community? Do they have value because they can't pass these standardized tests? And in some states, in some scenarios, you have to pass a standardized test before you can even earn your diploma, despite having the grades, like a proficiency test. So if they aren't able to achieve, it decreases their chances of joining some of these trades and labor forces. So if they do drop out of school, they don't drop out with the trade. They don't drop out being mechanically inclined. They might not drop out knowing how to use craftsmanship like woodwork and these different things. And that can lead to some of these unemployment rates, right? So during COVID, there was a lot of layoffs um, and, and black men were twice as likely to be unemployed than, than white males. And again, I really wanna make sure that we highlight that unemployment means that they were searching for work. So it's not just someone sitting on their couch and being lazy. No, I don't want that to be perpetuated at all. It was people actually looking for work and they couldn't. Next is the life expectancy. Um, life expectancy for, for Black men um, is far, far less than, than many other races, especially before the age of 65. So we really got to improve that idea of black, black men becoming grandparents. We got to normalize that and the importance of planning for our future and what that's going to look like. All right, next, I want to highlight the COVID-19 deaths. Uh, black men were more likely to die from COVID-19. Um, all of these things perpetuate the stigma and also affect the black male and his mental health. Criminal justice, right? That kind of goes without saying that black men make up the largest share um, of prisoners. As we, uh, when we look at the statistics, uh, even in Charlottesville, there was a high number of men who were incarcerated. So we, we want to make sure that we're stepping in to create spaces for coping skills and education and access so that black men are continuing to experience these hardships at such large numbers. It's kind of sickening if you really look at it. All right, mental health of black men. Mental health tends to be a taboo topic among men in general. Uh, given a choice, most would rather not talk about it. Uh, unfortunately, this is often more true for African-American men who experience mental health problems. At about the Leave same the rate as- I want you to li continue listening to it. Don't turn it off, boy. All right, if you don't mind, please mute your mics. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, it's often more true for African American men who experience these mental health problems at the same rate as others. But they continue. So, African American men, they're experiencing these at the same rate as others, but they're continuing to recognize uh, that they're, they're being untreated uh, in, in, in large spheres of recovery. Um, while the same factors that make a lot of men treatment adverse likely play a role cultural norms in their experiences uh, unique to African Americans may also account for this disparity. In some communities, mental health isn't always prioritized or acknowledged. And many Black men feel expected to endure problems like anxiety and depression rather than confront them. And some of that is brought to the reality of the definition of masculinity and what that looks like. 
if the definition of masculinity is taught in a toxic environment, then black men in some spaces are gonna be less likely to engage in what we would call a healthy relationship or a healthy mental health relationship or emotional IQ because of these toxic spaces or the development uh, of their knowledge of what mental health and when it's okay to ask for help or if it's not okay to ask for help. All right, mental health issues are relatively common in black communities at large. According to the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, African-Americans are 20% more likely to experience serious psychological distress, such as major depressive disorder than white Americans. Rates of major depressive disorder in young black adults ages 18 to 25, they increased by more than 3% between 2015 in 2018. And according to SAMHSA, Black Americans of all age groups are less likely to seek treatment than white Americans. Additionally, the US Department of Health and Human Service Office of Minorities, they reported that Black adults are more likely than white adults to experience persistent symptoms of emotional distress, such as sadness, hopelessness, and feeling that they have to dedicate extra effort to everything that they do. A lot of times that can correlate in that feeling of that imposter syndrome. So feeling like you're always being judged, um, feeling like you have to perform twice as hard uh, or twice as well as your counterparts to just get less of a grade or even to get equivalent of the grade. So all of these bias um, impede upon their everyday function. Sometimes uh, some of my colleagues and I will, will jokingly say, <clears throat> but very serious tone would say, what would you become? What would you have become if it wasn't for the racial bias? Um, if it wasn't for that unconscious bias that you deal with or that imposter syndrome that you deal with consciously or unconsciously related to how African-Americans are treated. Some people say, you know what? I probably would have been an astronaut, but you know, there's all these stigmas that say that African-American men shouldn't do certain things or maybe it's not as cool or it's not as uh, cool to do these things. So again, the numbers are, are showing that this is an issue and it is a problem and it needs to be addressed. Um, recently, not even recently, but yeah, uh, here in, in the more recent years, uh, suicide right amongst African-Americans is on the rise. And researchers are sounding the alarm. Mental health providers, um, we're out here and we're trying to make that difference about the number of young black men who are dying of suicide. Um, from, from the 26 year old son of uh, award-winning actress and director Regina King um, to the young mayor of New York, New Jersey. Some in the African-American community are speaking out uh, to raise more awareness about suicide and mental health especially when it comes to black men. Unfortunately, black men often suffer in silence. They don't seek the help that sometimes women will reach out to get. We'll call our girlfriends, um, let them know that things are not okay. But unfortunately, black men, we tend not to do that. Uh, we don't reach out for help. They ho we hold things in, uh, we, so we self-medicate sometimes, and then sometimes it also can present itself as a workaholic in these unhealthy, these unhealthy coping skills. And the idea that <clears throat> success equates to healing isn't realistic. Uh, a lot of times in these spaces, we create this dynamic and idea that if I work really hard, success will be my reward and everything that I'm doing is okay. But that's not the reality. If you have relationship issues, whether you are at base level, you know, blue collar working, hard working, or if you're a Fortune 500 uh, CEO, you might be wealthier and you might have more money, but that doesn't mean that you heal. You can still have those relationship issues at the top of your game or at the 
epitome of your success, at the top of your success. All right, so this year's theme um, for, for Black History Month was Black, Black Health and Wellness, set by the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Uh, the theme not only commemorates African Americans who make contributions to the medicine, but also highlighted ongoing issues within the Black community, uh, including mental health. I think now more than ever is the opportunity to have these discussions about Black men and, and suicide. Over the last decade, suicide rates in the United States, <clears throat> um, if you look at these charts, it's increased dramatically among racial and ethnic minorities and Black Americans in particular. Suicide deaths occur across the lifespan and have increased for Black youth but the highest rate of death is among Black Americans aged 25 to 34. I think the ideas believe that it's a, it's a multitude of issues, but I think we, it continues to trend and we got to bring these trends down uh, and bring conversation into the public arena about this so that we can persuade the numbers and, ch and change them. Our trauma. <clears throat> so looking at some of the things that can contribute, trauma is one of them. Um, exposure to trauma, whether it's through witnessing direct victimization um, or experiencing <clears throat> uh, indirect trauma through watching it on TV, uh, it can really impact how someone uh, maneuvers. Uh, a lot of times uh, I think back to uh, some of these spaces where people will you know, physically abuse their children. And what, what does that childhood trauma look like? And how does that affect someone? Um, if a child is walking down a sidewalk and it's raining, similar to the weather that we might have here today, it's, it's cloudy skies, a, a child might look at a puddle and they might wanna jump inside that puddle and they want to splash and kind of be a kid, right? Because our prefrontal cortex doesn't develop until age 21. So it's pretty age appropriate because the prefrontal cortex is a part of future thinking and the ability to think into the future. Um, so the kid just wants to jump in the puddle, okay? But a parent who decides to stop that child or snatch that kid or discipline that kid in an aggressive way can actually cause that trauma where the kid is gonna be less likely to explore. And we need these kids to be able to have that space to explore and to discover and engage in adventure because these are the techniques and tools that we're gonna to need to change the future of America and change the future of the world and society as a whole. We need that, that intuitive individual to keep that intuitive spirit and, and energy so when they grow into an adult, they can help us solve some of these issues like global warming and all these other barriers that we're facing. So the trauma is one of those things that can also be passed down from generation. So we want to we want to ensure that hurt people aren't hurting people. Um, and one of the best ways to do that is kind of self reflect and look at ourselves and say, hey, am I on the right track and am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing to change these these future generations. It can be, excuse me, it can be helpful and grounding when you're addressing someone to look at them as a learner. And also people who might have resentment towards their parents or towards a, someone who's senior to them uh, also look at them like they're a learner. Um, so it can ground you, you know, I'm a learner, they're a learner, and also their children are learners. Um, yeah, it can be, it can be really helpful in, in that aspect. Uh, one of my good colleagues, uh, Yolanda Jones, she had spoke about um, grounding yourself in, in the idea of learning spaces. Our anxiety. So as it relates to anxiety, uh, anxiety is among the most common mental health condition, yet many Blacks fear mental health stigma and avoid treatment. And those who seek care may encounter clinicians who don't really recognize the impact of racial trauma. Uh, some of them might engage in punishment tactics, uh, punishment tactics being um, just get over it. Uh, it's not it's not real. 
uh, you're 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 over exaggerating. You know what? If you think that this is race related, then I'm just going to cancel my session because everything's not race related. Um, or and, and that can just be traumatizing in itself. And then also you have the biological predisposition um, that also can can lead to that anxiety. I want to highlight the difference between introverted and debilitating anxiety. It's okay to be introverted because in a certain space and time, we do want to save the diagnosis of normal. Even though people are like, what is normal? What is normal? There is a space in counseling and mental health that does save room for the word normal. There is a group of theorists that believe we got to save normal. So normal is, um, you know, two 11 year old twins, or we'll say nine year old twin, twin boys running around the house, jumping on the furniture, running tracks, um, almost like uh, sometimes some people's Labradors do when the doorbell rings, you know. Uh, is that anxiety? Is that ADHD? No, that's normal. That's what they're kind of supposed to do. They're kids who are in the house in the summertime. Let them go outside and play. So I want to make sure we save space for normal. But in this capacity, I want to highlight anxiety and how it can be led on by that early trauma and abuse, along with the biological predispositions. Uh, so let's look at biological predispositions, meaning that you kind of inherit it from your parents. So I, I'm a Southern child uh, at heart. I was born in Arkansas. I was raised in Cincinnati, Ohio, but um, my, my roots are strong. If a child, <clears throat> Whenever it storms, this is kind of a Southern thing. Some people might understand, some might not. But a lot of times in the Deep South, uh, when it storms, people turn off the electricity and they turn off the TV um, and it's time to be quiet because it's raining and it's storming outside and you got to be quiet because God might be trying to tell you something. So some people rock in a chair, some people sit on the floor. People get creative and draw and color and, and do those sort of things, but technology is off. Now, if that's how I was raised, and that was the capacity in which I was brought up, when I raise my children, unless I've experienced, unless I've experienced other disciplines and other spaces, then that's that's how I'm gonna raise my kids uh, in, in that in that capacity where I'm gonna tell my children, oh, it's raining. Um, it's time to turn off the lights. So these old superstitions and different things like that, those can be passed down from generation to generation. So there is that biological uh, predisposition. And, and shy and inhabited temperament. Um, sometimes that's just the reality. Um, it's okay to be shy. The kid doesn't have to be a social butterfly. Sometimes Black men aren't social butterflies. But some of that can be related to the anxiety that they're experiencing. Um, when going through the different spheres that they've navigated throughout life. Their experiences might not be your experiences. And it doesn't make them less than, but I think it's important to highlight that these cultural nuances exist and they contribute to Black men and our mental health. In addition to that, I think it's important to highlight that there is another side that other people don't experience. So, uh, if an individual, for some people, they had supper growing up. So they would sit down and have these table dinners. And these table dinners were a great time. It was a great space for people to communicate, learn about the other family member, how their day went, how things were going, um, maybe bullies, uh, maybe uh, different anxiety or quirks or kinks or just different frustrating moments. Um, sometimes it can even be playing the spelling game. But not everyone experiences that. And a lot of times in the African-American household, it was less likely to have sit down dinners because they either one of the parents was working to make the, the difference of wage. So keep that in mind as you're dealing with some of these black men in these spaces, you know, not everyone's household is the same. And I think sometimes we forget when dealing with African-American men that they are a complex issue and that they need to be treated as so. All right, coping with racial trauma. So being seen and heard is essential to healing. 
uh, connecting with friends who are able to engage in racial consciousness um, conversations and willing to help you process your thoughts and emotions. Uh, a lot of people engage in prayer, mindfulness, uh, practice self-care, engaging in different activities, um, learning to be aware and recognize the symptoms of racial trauma. Uh, it can really be important to have that baseline and have these tools that can be helpful for when you're experiencing racial trauma. So what are these tools that might be helpful? So first, being able to identify what is your baseline? Um, how does it feel to experience racial trauma and manage it in a healthy way? So identifying that baseline of what it looks, what healthy coping looks like when you experience a racial situation or a racially drawing situation can help you identify if you're on target or if you're off target. So by developing that baseline of, hey, what does it look like when I've experienced racial trauma and I'm healing with it in a healthy way? Um, whether it's going to the gym, whether it's having that support group, or whether it's engaging with others who are like-minded, or even if it's just prayer um, or, or listening to music, uh, is that those are healthy tactics that can help you if you experience that racial trauma, uh, not necessarily, you know, some of these unhealthy coping skills um, that we, we all kind of hear about from time to time. All right. Next is, I, I think it's important to make a list of situations, people, places, um, and triggers that trigger your symptoms and your traumas, and make a similar list of ways to cope with each of those situations, uh, those people and places. So if you know that, you know, going to spaces where there aren't any African Americans, and that makes you uncomfortable, then I encourage you to what can you do to cope with that? So you know that the trigger is being in spaces where there aren't any other African-Americans. The other, so to cope with that, you might say, you know what, I'm just going to go to this event for 30 minutes and then I'm going to leave because I know I don't want to be there for a long period of time and belabor it, but I know I need to engage in this situation because it's for networking or whatever it may be. So set a time limit for how long you engage. I think it's important to understand that it is possible for Caucasians or white counterparts to go multiple days without seeing anyone of a different color. But for most African Americans, it is not possible to go out of your door and not see someone. I mean, it is art. Right. So it at white. White individuals are able to go outside and go a week or some a little bit less, three to four days. It's possible to not see a minority. But for African-Americans, it is possible to go multiple days and even weeks and not see someone that looks like you. And what does that do to someone's self-esteem? What does that do to someone's implicit bias? What does that do to someone's focus in mental health? So again, keep that in mind when you're thinking of Black men, is that sometimes they've been in spaces where they haven't seen anyone that looks like them for a little while. Um, even for some, uh, they, they didn't have their first African-American teacher until probably later in high school or even in college. And even then, it was kind of taboo and that person's name might stick out in their head because they never had that experience before. So when dealing with black men, I think it's important that you understand that not everyone's walk is the same and that their struggle is different and they notice it. Whereas some people have the privilege of not even noticing that, hey, I didn't see anyone that wasn't white. But for a lot of people, they don't have that option. As soon as they walk outside, they see it. I'm the only person that looks like me in this space. So coping with racial trauma, I think it's important that we have those diverse spaces um, and, and, and role playing. Uh, 
So when you in, engage in those situations, you have some skills that are necessary for you to show up um, the way that you would like to show up, um, no matter who's in the room and how they're behaving. I think it can be grounding to understand why you're there and your purpose. So sometimes you can ground yourself in like, why am I going to this event? You know, when you're anxious about stepping into a space, you can uh, ground yourself in the idea of saying, I'm going to network or I am going to pass out these business cards or, um, you know, for, for even children, why am I going to this, this space where I'm the only African-American on this team? Like, I don't want to be the representation of what Black is. I don't want to be the representation of uh, Black culture. But I encourage you to go in these spaces, reminding yourself why you're there. Like, I am here to be an athlete. I'm not here to tell them why Black people wear do-rags. I'm not here. You don't owe anyone justification for your actions. Just ground yourself in the reality of why you're there. Now, if you open yourself up, and it's presented in a healthy dialogue or you're open to healthy communication about why you maneuver the way you maneuver, then go ahead and do that. Um, I encourage it because these discussions in these spaces are necessary for growth. But I also understand maintaining your peace of mind. You don't have to be that representative for some folks. Um, another coping skill for trauma, um, the American Psychological Association uh, experience people who experience trauma in the aftermath uh, of these tragedies to practice self-care. So self-care goes all the way from connecting to family, friends, uh, other communities, and support people. Um, talk about your feelings, uh, and, and self-care uh, can be something. It doesn't have to be that expensive trip to the beach. Um, it can also be, you know, micro doses of self-care throughout the day. So what are micro doses of self-care? So that can look like humming your favorite song for 20 seconds. That can allow you to ground yourself so you can show up as your true self and, and not someone that you feel like they want to meet or that person that they want to see. Um, and, and another technique is to do the superhero technique. It's simple, but it works. You stand up tall, put your shoulders out and pretend that you're a superhero for 30 seconds and you look around the room and you scan your environment. So if you open an elevator and you see me standing like this, it's probably what I'm doing because 30 seconds in the superhero pose has been studied to improve your mood for about 30 minutes. And if that's what it takes, I encourage you to try it because a lot of people are doing it, but we gotta make sure that black men are also doing it and they know about these strategies because their journey is, it can be stressful, it's mm -hmm. tough. All right, here are some of the references that I have. And I just want to say thank you all for, for being here and, and engaging. Um, I would like to engage you all briefly in um, a quick breathing exercise. Uh, and the purpose of this is it's something that you can take with you uh, and you can also teach it to others. Um, and it doesn't, you don't have to get a degree to, to do it. All right. <clears throat> So I encourage you all to stretch always, shake your arms, I know you've been sitting for a while, uh, listening to me talk, wiggle your fingers. All right, now when we do this, we wanna make sure that one, our exhales are longer than our inhales. Two, it's important, it's not just me talking, it is important for you to breathe in your nose and out of your mouth, right? Because we wanna create that ebb and flow. All right, that circular motion. And then three, you really want the air to go into your stomach, excuse me, into your gut. <laughs> uh, and if you're doing it right, sometimes people tend to yawn, um, but that's okay. We're, we're getting grounded and we're decreasing our stress because we got to figure out ways to, to decrease our stress because stress isn't good. Stress can kill you. All right. So roll your shoulders, sit back in a comfortable position. Close your eyes if you're comfortable doing so. Let's begin. Breathe in your nose for a count of three. And out your mouth for a count of four. Breathe in your nose 
or count of three. And out your mouth for a count of six. Breathe in your nose for a count of three. And out your mouth for a count of four. Breathe in your nose for a count of three. And out your mouth for a count of six. All right, good job. Just know that you're here to make a change and make a difference. And one voice can stop an army. So we need people like you. I appreciate you all for coming today and feel free to reach out um, if you have any more questions. Again, my name is Nicholas Wright, licensed professional counselor. And my website is wgctoday.com. Can you put that in the chat? Um, yeah, plus your website. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm also always giving away free mental health tips on Instagram, journal prompts, all those sort of things on social media as well. And you can find that at the same handle at WGC today. Someone says thanks. Yeah, I appreciate I you coming. <laughs> Anybody have any questions for Nicholas? Alex said so helpful. She um, was the one who said she had to sign off a little early. Okay, awesome, <clears throat> awesome. Well, I appreciate you putting this together. Um, I really do. And I appreciate you inviting me. Yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time. And I think it's a very, very, very important um, topic and something that we need to hear more of and feel more comfortable in reaching out for mental health overall, and especially in the Black community. Um, you know, I think it's really, I wish we could get more people to feel more comfortable asking for help. But I would challenge everyone to, if you know somebody who needs help, you know, please try to reach out and offer any kind of support you can because mental health is really challenging. And, and I think a lot of us, everyone, I think is experiencing some forms of, you know, mental um, concerns and issues with everything that's going on in the world right now. Um, you know, and COVID, you know, and all the deaths that have occurred, we talk a lot about um, in our group meetings, you know, about how much people have had to deal with and continue to deal with on a daily basis and how, you know, the stress levels are so high. So it is very, very, very. Um, yeah, suicide like, is a tricky topic to navigate. It really is. So I encourage everyone to reach out for help. Um, or if you know someone, please reach out for help. Because the cool thing about it is we live in America. So um, the hospitals have to help you. If you call 911, they have to help you. They will send yeah. someone to pick you up and get you leveled out. Um, either it's needing someone to talk to, or um, if you if you want to go inpatient and, and maybe talk about medications or even non-medicated techniques to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a few questions in the chat. Um, will you be doing more? <laughs> I had my son watch. Someone wants to know if you're going to do any more talks. I guess. Yeah, um, so I do a lot of different talks, um, <laughs> like all over. I would encourage you to check out my Instagram and it'll update you on the different talks that I'm doing. Um, and I've done stuff from elementary schools um, to um, CIT training for, for police officers and just discussing that aspect of policing and how that can be helpful, um, as well as black men and, and mental health. But yeah. Um, just be on, on the lookout for that. Someone wanted, um, could you add references in the chat? But you put the, the references were on your last screen shot. Yes. I think you sent me. Is it okay if I send that out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let me give you the updated version. Okay. Or you could put it 
Yeah, you can send me another one and I can send it to the group um, that I communicate with. And if anybody has that's not with Star Hill Group um, and want to give your email, I can include you on uh, an email with Nicholas's references. And this um, discussion this evening is being recorded and we will, um, I just have to download it and upload it to our um, site. And so that could be sent out as well if you want to view it again or maybe have a friend um, view it. And Nicholas, if someone's interested in reaching out to you for help specifically, um, tell them the best way to reach you. Yeah, absolutely. So you can reach me directly at wgctoday.com. Um, and then my email, I can also add that into the chat, Nicholas Wright nicholas.wright at wgctoday.com uh, along with, um, and th those will probably be the easiest way. Um, I have psychology today. I accept most major insurances, uh, Aetna, Anthem, United, uh, Cigna, and I work with adults, so 18 and older. But yeah, we're, we're here, we're in the community. Uh, I just wanna help. Well, thank you so much for being here this evening and helping us out <laughs> on this very important topic. And hopefully we can have you again at another time, um, maybe as a follow-up. <laughs> yeah, no, road. absolutely. Yeah. I, um, sometimes I do community forums in the space where people will have their questions um, or something that they want to talk about, kind of like you hear on the radio where they say, mm -hmm. like, talk with an attorney. So oh, yeah. sometimes we do, like, talk with a counselor. Mm -hmm. And um, people will just write different subject matter and we'll just kind of go in on it, mm -hmm. give them free counseling advice. So maybe we could do that next time. I think that might be fun as well. Yeah, that would be good. That's a different spin on it. Do you usually get good uh, participation in those group sessions? Yeah, I, I usually do. But they are usually um, somewhat intimate. And then uh, so like, <clears throat> like for Kappa Alpha Psi, so that organization, they reached out to me and we just had like a forum for Black Men's Health. Um, right. I've done it for Masons. I've done it for like a UVA classroom um, mm -hmm. and just different different spaces where people just want to talk to a counselor. Right. And you work with all, you work with women and men, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and couples as well. I mean, it's tough. It's tough yeah. navigating mental health and mm -hmm. the concerns and especially the stigmas that we have. But I think the forums like this and the communities where we can normalize it, uh, it can make it easier because as parents, you know, we don't always know the answer, um, but we want to help. And, and sometimes as adults, we don't always know the answer. So right. they're having a, having a safe space to say whatever you want to say and not have to worry about it stabbing you in the back. Mm -hmm. It's really priceless. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what we help, you know, providing non-medicated techniques to help people overcome their barriers. So I encourage people to look at finding a counselor, like finding um, a good pair of jeans or a good pair of shoes. Sometimes the first ones you try on aren't the best. It's not the perfect fit for you, but I would encourage you to continue to try until you find some you like. Don't give up on the first shake. Mm -hmm. I'm also want to highlight uh, Charlottesville Clinicians of Color Network um, because they, they have grant funding for people in the Charlottesville and community area providing free counseling. So cvccn.org. Um, CVCCN. Yeah, put that in. Someone had just asked how to get help if you don't have insurance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you live in Charlottesville or surrounding counties, uh, this is the perfect time. Uh, CVCCN.org. Sorry, it's all caps. But the purpose is um, they have we have a grant right now. Um, the collective has a grant and it's providing free mental health counseling for people who might not be able to afford it or they have high deductibles. <clears throat> and, you know, if your deductible is forty five hundred dollars, it's like. For some people, and, and gas is five, it's like I can't reach 45 and it's just me on the insurance. So we have all these different issues with playing the part. But again, for people of color looking for counseling, I encourage you to check out cvccn.org. Um, it's also a list of clinicians in the area that are of color uh, that provide mental health counseling uh, and, and want to help.
All right. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> all right. No problem at all. And I'll email you the presentation um, and you can send it out. Thank okay. you all for coming. Thank Thanks you so for much. Having me. Okay. Bye-bye. Um, for my participants, just a reminder, tomorrow is um, Fresh Pharmacy Pickup Day. So just a reminder for that. Did anybody else have any other questions for me <clears throat> before we sign off? Got a few extra minutes tonight. <laughs> I'm Satora. Yeah. Um, how long is the yoga classes for? Um, the yoga program will go through um, September 30th. Oh, okay. All right. Um, the program, they set it up the way they do their programming, which was May through September. So um, I haven't heard anything from them recently to say, you know, if they were thinking, I mean, the only reason I could think they might not do it as long as if the attendance um, slows down, I'm not sure. I haven't heard anything from John as far as like how many people are coming because I haven't been able I'm not able to come to all of them. Okay, I just asked because I had I missed Thursday night, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to be sure I hadn't missed the last night because I had I never knew when the end date was. No, right. You still have through the summer, um, and please, okay. please keep coming. And you know, even if I guess if you have a friend or family member that wants to come, bring them along because we're trying to get more participants. I know it's primarily it's for our patients, but, um, you know, they are not really um, checking that and we want more people to come. So if you have a friend, you know, bring a friend or family member, if somebody else is interested in coming, I would say. So is that, um, is that an age limit on that? I mean, like a 12 year old? Um, I think it's, I mean, you know, they set it up mainly for our patients and so oh, okay. we're all adult age but i mean you know if you said you had to bring her with you because you don't have anybody to stay with her i think that's fine okay yeah <laughs> i have i have really enjoyed that i mean he's stretched out stuff that hurt yeah <laughs> <laughs> so how has there been how many about how many people have been coming in the evening when uh, when I went week before last, we had five, okay, including myself. So that had gone up from what it started off with. Yeah, I know it started off slow, mm -hmm. and the so, daytime I think was about five, right? Four or five, it depends. And I know some folks can't come to every single one, so sometimes there's uh, maybe not as many as others. So, okay. um, yeah. So, so Tua, no, I'm hearing you correct that we can invite people now that that's not in the program. Well, I mean, you know, don't broadcast. It. <laughs> no, I won't. But know, if one other person wanted to come. Yeah, I'm saying right. I'm saying that I I feel it's okay to bring a friend or a family member, one person uh -huh. to come with one me person, yeah. because I, um, you know, we want the classes to continue. And the attendance and participation is the key, you know, to keeping it going. You know, I don't want it to seem like, um, you know, that people aren't interested because it has been kind of slowly attended. And I do understand that, you know, not the timing is not always opt optimal. So I would also say, if, you know, if there are other times maybe to look at for future, um, you know, um, we tried to offer a morning time and an evening time. And I know days of the week um, are different for everybody because everybody has different schedules. So it's hard to pick a time, you know, that works great for everybody. Um, initially, we thought the Wednesday uh, morning time was good because on Wednesdays we do have fresh pharmacy. So you all would be coming here at least every other Wednesday. But um, I know some folks, um, the church has um, Bible study on Wednesday at Mount Zion, I know of. Um, mm -hmm. 
And anyway, it is hard to pinpoint or find a day that a day and time that's good for everybody. So then that's why we had the evening time too as another option and for people who were working. So, um, you know, we're trying to stretch it out, but um, if they offer it again, you know, we can look at potentially offering it on a different day and time if that's something that might, you know, if there are a bunch of people that, you know, like the same day or something. I don't know, I can't guarantee anything, but, you know, we do want to be able to keep it going and I hope they'll offer it again, um, you know, for next year, because it'll end in September, the end of September. Um, and so it wouldn't be potentially offered again until uh, May again, but that will depend on, you know, if they are still willing to offer it because they do have to have the instructor and all that, so. But I think it's great that we've been able to have, you know, have the opportunity for everyone. All right, ladies, so if there's nothing else, I'm gonna sign off and I'll see several of you tomorrow, probably. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Have a good night, everybody. Have a good evening. Good night, everyone, thank you. You're welcome.